It's 2021 during the pandemic. In the first scene, Matthew gets off the train and is in a haste to meet up with a prospective buyer. He takes a ferry to his ancient house, which he claims has been sold at a cheap price. The buyer is not interested in a gold-designed gun, which is his family's heirloom that belonged to an influential man in the past. He also showcases his ancestors' pictures encased in dust, but the buyer advises him to keep them for honoring the dead. He takes up the gun and proposes to pay 500000 and Matthew is surprised at the huge amount. He remembers that his late mother was possessive of the gun, so he offers to seek permission from her first, before he sells it. To show his seriousness, the buyer increases his bid from 500000 to 650000 which leaves Matthew dumbstruck. He visits his mother at the columbarium and asks her for a sign if she does not support him selling the gun. He ignores the other people who stare at him and points out that the money can be used to buy a car. When there is no sign, he is giddy with happiness as he thanks his mom and proceeds to leave. Outside, the bright weather suddenly changes. It becomes dark and the box with the gun in it turns a bright color. Matthew brings out the gun, which is quickly changing color and vibrating in his hand. He shakes in horror as thunder strikes and the sun sets. He fires the gun and is suddenly and magically transported into another world. He finds himself in an open and sunny space, still holding the gun. He tries to go back to his previous life, but is devastated when he cocks the gun, and it makes no sound. He plows through the area and finds himself by the riverside. He is astonished to find people rowing canoes, a far cry from what he is used to. Father Jean Baptiste carries a box that he got from a Chinese merchant into the church. Meanwhile, Miss Sorn who's reading an English newspaper. Miss Sorn is an opinionated woman who studies English under Father Jean. He forces the box open and beckons on her to see its contents. It contains a dusty book written in a foreign language. Miss Soren is able to read it with a bit of difficulty. It is a student's journal detailing how she traveled back in time. Father Jean Baptiste hands over the journal to Miss Soren and asks her to study it and give him feedback. In the next scene, Bob is in a deep sleep on the floor. He dreams that a woman thumps her journal on his head for snooping, as she writes. He wakes up with a grin. Imagining her beautiful smile, he goes to draw her. His dramatic mother knocks on his door. She invites him to visit his fiancée Sorn, who he has been stalling to meet over the years. She believes that, since their lifelines are tied together, they will live longer if they get married. If they don't get together, one of them will die. She becomes emotional at the thought of losing her son. Bob is surprised at her outburst, so he opens the door and assures her that he will pay Sorn a visit immediately. Satisfied with her success, she quickly wipes off her tears with a smirk on her face. He makes a trip with his parents to meet Sorn, but is told that she has gone to church. He informs her parents that they are here to meet with them. Sorn's parents are confident that he has come to proceed with the marriage, but they and his parents are disappointed. When he suddenly breaks off the engagement, he has a distant look on his face while on the boat, and an idea pops into his head to go watch a play. There, he enjoys his time laughing with other people. Sorn is there with her friend, but finds the show boring, and is more interested in the steamboat from England that she read about in the newspaper. Bob, who sits beside them, is distracted by their chatter. He tells them to keep quiet so he can understand the play. Sorn is affronted by his rudeness. She turns to give him a piece of her mind, and their gazes meet. It's their first time seeing each other, so they do not recognize that they are betrothed. Bob is surprised to see her. Her face has been a constant in his dreams, imagination, and paintings. Sorn gets an odd feeling. She complains of having chills and leaves with Pi, her help. Bob chases after her and demands to know her name and parents. She mocks him on his use of thy, which she claims makes him sound ancient. When he insists on her name, she gives him a fake name and claims that her helper is her sister. But he is smart and calls them out on their lies. Pi feels that he is trying to flirt with Sorn, so she warns him off and informs him that Sorn is engaged to be married to Bob. He is surprised when his name is mentioned, and it dawns on him that the opinionated woman is his betrothed, Sorn. She asks him how he knows her name, and he informs her that he is her fiancé, and he has just returned from her house, where he broke off their engagement. Things got quite heated there, both parents had a row, and declared war on each other's families. Sorn is happy with the outcome, while Bob is sad to see his dream woman slip through his fingers. He goes drinking with his Uncle Fu, bemoans his fate, and compares himself to a fictitious character in Uncle Fu's story, whose fiancé was taken from him. His uncle calls him a fool and blames him for his predicament. He is willing to do anything, from asking his uncle to change the ending of the story to using magic to win Sorn back, but Uncle Fu refuses. He tells him to use his heart to win Sorn back. Bob tries a new plan. He resolves to follow Sorn around until he wins her over. He looks happy following her to the church, but Sorn is annoyed with him and does not want him around her. Pai convinces her to treat her poorly in his presence, to make him lose interest in her. She painfully slaps her on the cheek, but Bob is not watching. When he witnesses more painful slaps, which draw blood and leave marks, he is not perturbed. He calls them out and informs them that he knows that it's an act. Soren is exhausted already. Father Jean teases her, but she does not appreciate it. Bob apologizes for ending their engagement, but Soren does not hear of it. 
She accuses him of leaving her for four years, without checking on her. He begs her for another chance, even if he has to wait, but Soren breaks his heart, when she tells him to wait till their next life. In the next scene, the village is agog with the arrival of the enormous steamboat Soren read about in the newspaper. It is revealed that the steamboat is bought on the orders of the Prince of Siam, to help them in their fights with other nations. She leaves the house in a hurry, to where the steamboat is docked. DHE and the other villagers stare and wonder at its size, and also at the men who came on it. Bob, along with his boss, welcome the captain of the ship, Mr. Henry, who re-engages on the agreed price for the ship. They are not pleased with the new development, but Bob tunes out the conversation, when he sees Soren from afar, until his boss calls him to order. Soren loses her footing while at the edge of the river, and is at the brink of falling into the water, Bob sees her and rushes to save her, but a stranger gets to her first, and they fall. They are safe on the walkway, while Bob dramatically falls into the water. People gather to witness the commotion, Soren is fascinated with her savior at first glance. He assures her that he is alright, but is petrified when he notices he is hurt. With Pai's help, Soren tears out a piece of cloth and wraps it around his hand. He is impressed with Pai's skills, and exclaims the exact words Soren read in the diary. She is surprised at the coincidence, but decides to keep her cool. Bob comes out of the river, dripping water, and stares in anger as Soren pays attention to the stranger. His jealousy pushes him to seize the stranger's gun, and accuse him of theft. Matthew tells him it's a gift from Mr. Hunters, but Bob does not agree. He is oblivious to the existence of sunglasses and a mobile phone, which he finds in Matthew's pockets. But Soren recollects seeing a drawing of a phone in the diary. When Bob confiscates his items and dismisses him, Soren assures Matthew in English that she will return his gun to him. Later, Soren visits Bob's house to steal the gun but she meets his mother, who is still angry over the fallout of their families. Soren apologizes to her, and with Pai's help, they trick her into drinking an alcoholic drink. When she is inebriated, Soren sneaks into Bob's room with Pai on the lookout. She is unsuccessful in her search, but is shocked to find the drawings Bob made of her. Bob returns and finds his mother drunk. He suspects Soren and marches to his room, where he finds her with a gun, which Soren mistakes for Matthews. When she learns that she is mistaken, she proposes a deal with Bob for the gun. The next scene shows Soren, Bob, and Matthew in the church. Soren advises Matthew to tell them the truth about his phone, sunglass, and gun, so that they will be returned to him. She shows him the journal, written by Lady Carricot in 2018, and the drawing of a phone. Matthew is surprised as he flips through the journal. He observes the pattern between his story and Lady Carricot, so he reveals to them that he is from 2021, which is 177 years from the present date. This leaves Soren and Bob in shock. He tells them how he was transported into the past, to the time of his ancestors. He luckily scored a job from Mr. Henry, who was impressed with his skills, and promoted him to be his assistant. Bob is furious at his continued presence and affinity with Sorn. He wants him to go back to his previous life, but Matthew tells him that he has tried to do so several times, but has not been successful. He can only be transported back, when the planet Rahu swallows the sun. But he does not know when, so he always carries the gun with him for this purpose. Sorn takes him to Father Jean, who she believes knows everything under the sun. He divines to Matthew that Rahu will swallow the sun in two months, albeit for a short while, so he has to be prepared for it at all times. Soren takes permission from Father Jean to allow Matthew to read the journal, but he does not agree to it, especially when he hears his name mentioned in the journal. He sees no need to know what the future holds, and commands Soren to either lock up the diary, or quit coming to learn from him. She is unhappy as she returns the box to its safe. In the next scene, at the prince's palace, Bob is with his boss, the minister of the treasury. The boss tries to convince the royal advisor to the prince of Siam, to advise the prince to buy the steamboat from Mr. Henry, for their naval fleet. The prince is adamant about not buying the steamboat. He is wary of the boat's ability to float on water, and is also doubtful of Mr. Henry, and the increased price for the boat. Mr. Henry is enraged by the prince, even more so when he refuses to visit the dock, to be convinced of the boat's mobility. At the prince's exit, Mr. Henry goes off on a tirade berating the Siamese. He accuses them of being cheats, and vows to cause trouble for them, with the British Navy. Bob tries to salvage the situation. He assures Mr. Henry and the other advisors, that he would construct a miniature ship to be presented to the prince, so he would see the possibility of boats floating on water. He is given permission to board the ship, with Soren and Matthew in tow. He is annoyed, and finds it difficult to concentrate on his drawing, because Matthew and Soren are hovering around the ship. He is angry at their blossoming friendship, and they stare at him, as he stomps out in fury. The lovebirds go through the pilot's book. Matthew tries to explain to Soren what a crying face is, so they draw it on their faces with charcoal. It looks funny to Soren, so she seeks out Bob, who is watching the waters on the deck. She draws tears on his face, and it makes him happy that she came to him. 
his mood changes when he notices that Matthew is with her. In his haste to leave, he slips and hurts his leg in the process. Matthew runs to his rescue to help him stretch his leg, while Bob watches happily as Soren admires his drawings. He is annoyed when he notices Matthew watching her too. He is curious about his intentions towards Soren. Matthew mentions that he likes her and wants to go out with annoyed at his admission. Bob grabs him by his collar. Matthew frees himself and admits that though he likes her, he wouldn't court her because he'll leave soon for his real life. He proceeds to give Bob a few tips to win Sorn over, starting with his sunglasses. The next scene shows Bob looking comical wearing sunglasses while directing the workshop workers. He pats his hair in slow motion and throws a cute smile at Sorn and Pi, who are quite confused at his latest antics. True to Matthew's advice to bomb Sorn with love, he proceeds to leave little flowers for her everywhere. But he overdoes it, and she finds flowers in her food. Sorn is angry at the flowers and does not find them appealing. She picks the flowers that she has been keeping and throws them at Bob. He reports to Matthew, who is quite impressed with his first attempt. He informs him of the second tip, which is to hover over her and give her help. Bob follows Sorn around and helps her with mundane activities, like serving water to workers and even turning pages for her. Sorn is tired from his hovering and tells him to quit. Matthew's third tip is for Bob to disappear to get make Sorn worried about him. But Bob is frustrated at how he would disappear when he has a ship to build. Matthew advises him to find a way and make it work. The next day, Bob takes the advice and rows farther, rather than stop at the workshop. Sorn is curious because she doesn't know where he is going. At the workshop, he avoids her and doesn't talk to her. Sorn offers him fruits, but he rejects them. She tries to find out what the problem is, but he tells her of his decision not to talk to her again. Matthew is behind him and encourages him. Bob tries to get Sorn jealous and mentions that he plans to take his imaginary girlfriend out, since he does not believe in destiny anymore. Sorn congratulates him, proceeds to Matthew, and feeds him some fruits. Bob is furious and feels that Matthew has just tricked him. The next day, he shows off the engine of his ship to Sorn and Matthew, but they hardly understand him. When Sorn points out that the paddle is moving too fast, he laughs it off, but he senses danger when the whirring sound increases. He instructs them to take cover and pushes them out of the way as his ship explodes. Bob is gutted to find his hard work blown into smithereens, but is glad that the other two are okay. Unfortunately, he does not go unscathed. Soren and Matthew point out that he has a piece of wood stuck to his backside. He is alarmed, and Matthew faints at the sight of blood. The doctor is called to remove the piece, while Matthew keeps him company and holds his hand during the process. The doctor is quite firm as he removes the piece and stitches him up. Bob admits he is thankful that the piece hit him, and not Matthew or Sorn. Matthew is impressed with him, and declares him a rare item. Bob is resting after the suture. Sorn approaches him and inquires about the process. Bob is happy that she calls him Bob, and not Chief. The next day, he is hard at work in the workshop, visibly in pain. When he notices Sorn watching him, he drops his hammer and screams for help. Sorn rushes to help him, and he gifts her beautiful flowers. She appears to have developed a soft spot for him. She blushes at his flattery and accepts the flowers from him. They also share jokes, and she leaves him with a smile on her face. At the workshop, she gives him a hand to help him out of the boat, but when he makes a joke to tease her, she leaves him. She comes across a tree of orchids that Bob planted for her to declare his love for her. She is impressed with his flower idea. She decides to take some dish to him, but overhears him tell Matthew that he is interested in her because she reminds him of her ex. He has dreams of her. This is a far cry from the huge love declaration she expected, so she leaves in anger. Later at night, Bob invites Sorn out to the balcony, where he proposes to her, with fire light spelling marry me, and a garland of flowers, all with Matthew help. Sorn is emotional at the display. When she asks him why he wants to marry her, he replies that they are destined to be together. She tears up at his response and walks away, leaving Bob kneeling. A wind blows and turns off the fire light. This leaves Bob sad. His plans did not go as planned. It's a bright day at the palace. Bob's mood is dark as he awaits the prince to see the boat he built. His boss is worried about his expression and assures him that the prince will be pleased with his construction. The prince is excited when he sees the miniature ship float on water. He is impressed with Bob's creativity and wants the Siamese engineers to build their own ship and ignore Mr. Hunter's pricey ship. He claims that he is not afraid of the Westerners, and this news does not go down well with Bob and his boss. On his way home on the boat, he notices some people carting away things from the British pier. He follows them to the prince's theater. He is surprised when he recognizes the prince's masked guard, who is overseeing them carrying the smuggled items into the prince's theater. Although it's windy, he rushes to the church in search of Father Jean. He meets Sorn, who tells him that Father is out. He informs her that something suspicious is going on with the steamboat, and would like to know if the diary says anything about it. They sneak in and find out that the safe that holds the box containing the journal is empty. They notice a masked thief running away with the box, and Bob gives him a hot chase and catches him. He unveils him and finds out it is Matthew. They are surprised and hurt to see him, but he begs them that he only wants to find out something from the journal. 
He informs them that Mr. Henry is furious and has vowed to sell the steamboat to Kinchin China, Siam's enemy. Soren does not agree to open the box, but Matthew tricks them into voting, and the majority vote for reading the journal. She is forced to agree, and Matthew reads the book and reveals information about Mr. Hunter's downfall. He is hesitant to read out more of what he saw in the book. Thunder strikes loudly, and Soren hugs Bob for safety. When she realizes what happened, she is embarrassed and moves away from him. Bob reveals what he saw to them, but Matthew has no idea about it. Bob asks him to search Mr. Henry's office for any smuggling evidence. Another thunder strikes, and Matthew quickly tears out the page from the diary that has him in a twist. The next scene shows Matthew looking for Mr. Hunter. He finds him rowing a boat in the distance. Bob and his uncle go to seek out the prince's theater. They are caught by a guard, but they outmaneuver him and take the theater's key from him. Matthew, on the other hand, is caught by the prince's masked guard, who tries to shoot him. But Mr. Hunter is on time to save him. He lies that Matthew is with him, but the guard is quick to remind him that he should have come alone. The guard is suspicious that someone might talk about the smuggling business, and it could trouble. Bob and his uncle are in the theater. They open one of the trunks and find curtains. A curious Bob searches further, and is surprised to find guns hidden underneath the curtains. Bob concludes that the prince and Mr. Hunter are planning a coup. Mr. Henry questions Matthew on why he followed him, but he is hesitant to answer him. Mr. Henry gets angry and threatens to shoot him. Matthew is scared. He shows him the pistol and tells him the story of how he was transported. Mr. Henry is confused and does not believe him. Matthew advises him not to follow the orders of the king, but Mr. Henry does not listen to him. He is in cahoots with the prince, who has promised him a position. He locks him up in the room and threatens to sell him into slavery. It's late, and Sorn awaits Bob by the window. She ignores Pi's order to go to sleep. The next morning, Matthew is alarmed when the door rattles. He thinks it is Mr. Henry, who has come to carry out his threat. He picks up the chair to defend himself, but is surprised when Bob comes in. He is emotional that Bob has come to save him. He hugs him and informs Bob of Mr. Henry's plan to hand over Siam to the British. Bob is angry with him for hiding such information from him. Matthew meets Sorn, who is still worried about Bob. He informs her of the plot, and Sorn is surprised. She sets out in a hurry to send word to her father and another minister to return quickly from the urgent work the prince cunningly sent them to. Pi hands Matthew a drawing of Sorn and Bob, wishing Matthew goodbye. He is emotional as he looks up to the sky and notices the bright sun. Bob is on the lookout at the dock and watches as the guards load cases into the steamboat. He overpowers a guard. Meanwhile, Sorn hands over a letter to Pi to be taken to her father while she goes to join Bob. Pi refuses and holds her tightly. She is afraid that Sorn would lose her life, thereby fulfilling the prophecy, but Sorn assures her that she will be fine. Sorn goes to the dock, where the steamboat is ready to leave. She confronts Mr. Henry and informs him that the police and soldiers are coming, so he has to stop his plans. Mr. Henry is unaware that she knows of the plot. He tells her that he has done nothing wrong, except try to celebrate someone's birthday with some shots in the river. But Sorn is not cowed by his lies. He laughs at her brevity but is caught unaware when Matthew covers him with a sack and carries him out, with Sorn hot on his legs. They are ambushed by guards wielding guns, who take them as prisoners and tie them up in the boat. Bob is on the boat but is powerless to do anything. When they are in the middle of the water, Mr. Henry stops the boat and nods his head at the prince's masked guard. Soren and Matthew are shocked when he commands the guards to set up the cannon to fire at the city of Siam. Mr. Matthew is confused too because the plan was to shoot the cannons into the sky and not at the Siamese walls. The guard orders his followers to tie up Mr. Henry and the other British men on the boat. At the palace, the royal advisor to the king has a celebratory drink with his friend. He boasts of manipulating the prince to cause war between Siam and Britain. He plans to remove both the prince and Mr. Henry from the way so he can take over ruling Siam. Back on the boat, the cannon is lit. Bob rushes out with a rope and turns the cannon towards the sky, where it explodes and falls into the river. The water becomes turbulent, and some people fall into the water. Sorn and Matthew are scared, but they are secured with the ropes tied to their hands. Sorn is impressed by Bob's brevity and tells him that. While he loosens the ropes on her hands, he also sets Matthew free and tells them to hide while he waits for the troop. He assures Matthew that his history will be preserved. Matthew is touched by Bob's selflessness. He hugs Bob, who feels uncomfortable at the display of affection. Changing their minds, Matthew and Bob go to untie Mr. Henry, but the masked guard lifts off the cannon that fell on him and stands. Sorn notices him and raises an alarm. He aims the gun at them and shoots. Matthew pushes Bob from the way, and they both fall to the ground. The bullet narrowly escapes a whimpering Mr. Henry. Sorn helps Matthew up, while Bob tries to overpower the masked guard. He signals to Sorn and Matthew to hide. They run towards the cockpit, and some of the guards who fell into the water climb back onto the steamboat. Matthew decides to stall them, while Sorn goes in. Sorn follows the training Matthew gave her on steering the boat. Although it is difficult to handle, she tries to move the boat toward the city. Meanwhile, Matthew overcomes one of the guards and throws him into the river. He goes to help Sorn move the boat. The fight between Bob and the masked guard is fiercer than ever, with the guard winning. 
He lights up the cannon to fire another shot at the city wall, but is surprised when the shot goes into the water. He commands his guards to aim at the city wall, but Matthew stops them. He faces Matthew, and is quick to beat him to a pulp. The masked guard aims his gun to shoot Matthew, but Bob comes from behind and places Matthew's sunglasses on his face. He is confused as it goes dark. He fires his shot close to Mr. Henry again, who is furious at his close calls. Bob takes advantage of the moment and hits him. The sunglasses smash, and the guard's mask breaks. Both Bob and Mr. Henry are surprised that the guard is a British spy. He is furious that he has been exposed, and renders a huge blow to Bob, that makes him lose consciousness. The British spy reloads the cannon and lights it up. He is surprised when the matchbox goes off. Bob's Uncle Fi, who is a magician, is responsible for it. He makes incantations that keep making the match go off. The British spy is frustrated and keeps trying. When it seems he will succeed, Soren throws Matthew's phone at him, which makes the match fall into the water. He is furious at her for ruining his plans. Soren is afraid, when she sees Bob and Matthew lying down. The English spy refills his gun with the aim of shooting her. Suddenly, it slowly becomes dark. Matthew, who is in pain, realizes that it is time for him to go. He aims the pistol at the sun, but Soren snatches it from him, and points it at the spy. Matthew is alarmed. He begs her not to shoot the spy, since she might be transported into the future. The spy also points his gun and shoots her, but she is not hurt. The spy is confused. He refills his gun, with the aim of shooting her again. But Bob is up, and he holds Soren's hands. They aim the gun at the spy. He decides to be transported with her to the future, if that happens to be the case. They fire a shot at the spy. It hits him, and Bob and Soren, who are impacted by the shot, fall into the water. The weather suddenly clears up. Matthew frantically calls out for Soren and Bob, but he gets no response. In the water, Soren has drowned, and loses hold of the pistol. She suddenly finds herself in a brightly lit room. Bob comes into the room, and addresses her as Karakut. He tells her that she has been in deep sleep. She is confused to hear that she is indeed Karakut. She sees her journal and notices her new attire. She reads through the journal, and is in tears when she finds out, that it is the same journal she got from Father Jean. Her husband approaches her, and concludes that she is crying because the pages of her journal are filled. He promises to get new journals for her. She cries some more, and hugs him, because of his obvious love for her. The next scene shows Bob and Soren in the water. Bob holds her, and brings her up above water level. Matthew sees them from the boat and helps them out. They enter the boat, but Soren is still unconscious. Matthew demonstrates CPR to Bob, but Soren does not wake up. Matthew describes mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation to him, but he is hesitant to try it out. Bob tries to perform it himself, but Matthew pushes him away to do it. In the process, he remembers the conversations and glances he shared with Soren in the past. He is miserable, when Soren still does not wake up. But she suddenly coughs out water, and regains consciousness. Soren is in tears as she calls him by name, and they smile at each other. Meanwhile at the palace, the prince has returned with the colonel and the army. They ambush the prince's royal advisor and his friend. The prince is hurt that his trusted confidantes used his name, to commit such heinous crimes. He apologizes, and claims he did it for the prince. But he suffers a heart attack, which is caused by Bob's uncle Fi. In the next scene on the boat, Soren's help leads her home, while Mr. Hunter helps Matthew down from the boat. Henry is arrested by the Siamese police. He thanks Matthew and calls him son. Bob apologizes to Matthew for losing the pistol. Matthew is not too concerned about it, and makes a light joke out of it. Bob initiates a hug between them, even though he still does not feel comfortable with it. Matthew is surprised at him, and gives him a better hug. The Siamese prince arrives, and they see the contents of the cases the spy was smuggling into the prince's theater. The British spy is put in prison, while Mr. Hunter is sent into exile, just like the journal said. Father Jean hands over the chest containing the journal to Sorn, because it belonged to her in her other world, as Lady Karakut. Sorn wishes to record the events happening in her life. Father is pleased with her response, and also promises to record history his own way. Matthew is happy with the hat and the wrapped piece Mr. Hunter left for him. He sees a young worker pay, who compliments the hat on him. He takes a box from her to place the wrapped piece in, but is surprised when he opens the wrap, to see the gun that transported him. He remembers seeing a picture of the hat atop a box in his mother's house, from his previous life. He also remembers seeing a picture of a descendant of Mr. Henry and his wife, who he feels are him and pay. A leaf falls on a sleeping sorn, and she finds Bob walking away from her house. She confronts her parents, and her father informs her that he chased him away, after he confessed that he took liberties with her, and wants to marry her. Sorn runs out and chases after Bob. She hitches a ride with two unfriendly women, in her haste to reach him. Bob is summer on his way, but he overhears her shouting his name. She meets up with him, and joins him on his boat. He hands her flowers, and she tells him that they were together in their past lives. Bob reassures her that it does not matter. He only has her in mind, and not Lady Karakut. They are both pleased and happy that they have resolved their issues. They get married, and Soren insists they take pictures for their children. Bob is quite frightened by the camera, which he believes pulls souls into it, and prefers to draw them. Soren assures him, that if the camera pushes his soul into it, she would follow him along. 